Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Avery and I'm the marketing manager here at AI Media. The featured speaker for today is our chief product officer, Bill McLaughlin, who will walk us through live captioning with IP video standards. There is scheduled time at the end of the webinar for questions, so please ensure you submit them using the Q&A function. Now, without further ado, I'd like to hand things over to Bill. Thanks, Avery. Um, welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming to uh, our most recent uh, webinar. And uh, the, this in this webinar, uh, we're going to talk primarily about uh, the Alta product, which provides live closed captioning in IP video streams. Uh, I've been personally involved in this product uh, you know, pretty much since its birth in, in around 2015. We were originally doing um, you know, primarily uh, compressed MPEG transport streams. And uh, the product began working with a, you know, a few major uh, you know, OTT style uh, live streaming broadcasters at the time when you know, that business was not as well developed as it is today. And obviously there was a, a need to kind of do closed captioning and subtitling service that was equivalent to what you could do on um, traditional television, cable, satellite distribution. Uh, the Alta product stepped into that niche and um, we've seen you know, as we've as we've gone from you know compressed workflows and doing things like um, contributions through SRT and MPEG transport stream have become a much more mainstream way of working. Uh, you know, not just in OTT, but even in you know aspects of more traditional broadcast, as well as a, a lot of new work in live events production that now relies on IP video and a more professional level than you know, what, what, what might have been done before more with like RTMP or other earlier generally lower bandwidth standards. Um, and that's moved now also into the uncompressed domain and SMPTE 2110. So uh, a lot of the, you know, really high end uh, broadcast theater and live event productions may have 2110 in their workflow, which is a standard that is basically you know, fully equivalent or better than SDI in terms of being uncompressed video at a full broadcast frame rate um, and being able to do everything you'd be able to do in traditional linear SDI production, but being able to do that in an all IP network, um, generally realizing a lot of cost savings, at least on the, uh, you know, the main kind of switch and router core, um, realizing a lot of density improvements. And uh, the, the Alta product has remained kind of durable to these different video standard improvements, which has been really neat to see. You've been able to build out a lot of features, whether that's in, in live captioning and subtitling, um, you know, some ancillary features like uh, SCUDI data and time code data, and been able to build that out in a variety of IP standards so that, as you'll see, uh, a fairly similar product is available then um, across these standards. Um, the product, uh, if you've been following our products and our webinars for a long time, is originally developed uh, through EEG. EEG is now part of uh, AI Media for the past year. And uh, at this point, products like the Alta product, which are primarily in the enabling technology space for broadcasters and streamers, really a, a video production technology, is merged under the same roof with a lot of the other things that our customers need to do for captioning and language accessibility. Um, so we, we include a, you know, a really great brand for providing human services, essentially stenographers and voice captioners who will provide expert transcription across a really wide variety of subjects and languages. Um, we have automatic captioning, um, Lexi and Lexi Translate, which can provide AI-based captioning for, you know, events that are faster paced, you know, like uh, generally lower cost than what you would use a human captioner for. And we're able to merge all of that together in a way that, you know, really other vendors that are more either on one side of the fence or the other, um, frankly, either, either really just a service agency, just an ASR company, 
just a video technology company. We've tied that together and are really tightly focused on this captioning and subtitling marketplace and be, you know, being able to fill the whole picture uh, of your video production needs in that area. So uh, while, while we have SDI encoding products and another product, which I think we're going to probably have some interest in maybe at the end in the Q&A, uh, which is Falcon, which is a cloud hosted subscription um, RTMP based caption encoder. Today's webinar is going to focus on the virtualizable Alta products. And the Alta product, again, is IP streaming video um, in either a compressed or an uncompressed format, uh, basically transport streams or 2110. Um, and it's available, you know, it's something that is a fully virtualizable package. So you can use it on prem in a video studio, you can have it deployed to uh, the cloud. Um, it's, it's fully virtualized. And so it provides the functionality that a traditional broadcast SDI caption encoder would provide, but you can do it at a much larger density with a lot of channels per server, and you can do it based on your own hosting so you're not tied to, you know, the hardware boxes that, that AI media sends. Essentially, you can, you can put this on uh, virtualized platforms, either on-prem or in you know, AWS and Google Cloud Platform and any other place where you would be able to host uh, virtualized software. So here's a little overview of what we'll talk about today. And we'll just kind of start with an overview of the Alta product um, for, for those who haven't seen it before. Um, and what are our motivations really for when customers are interested in this product? And we, we see that it's that Alta is a caption encoder for when you know, you're ready to move to IP video in a production and looking for something that's software driven, fully virtualized, and remains flexible and compatible with the caption source workflows that you're used to working with. So that will probably turn out to be a range depending on your precise application of you know, working with AI media human captioners, working with third-party captioners, working with ASR, working with teleprompters, um, working with pre-scripted caption or subtitle files that might be in an archive and, and go live to air. So all of these pretty conventional broadcast and production workflows are going to be supported but in, an, in a completely IP and virtualized package, right? And, you know, content producers need to move to this as they're going through these various business transitions that, you know, I think we understand are not fundamentally about closed captioning. You know, we don't need to move from SDI to IP um, because of closed captioning, but we need to move from SDI to IP to realize the flexibility, the cost savings, the ability to get new features, the ability to launch new OTT channels, um, and closed captioning, you know, needs to come along for the ride, and we need to make sure that we're still able to do the same things with captioning and subtitling in the IP domain that we would be able to do in the SDI domain. Um, if you're transitioning from, you know, some other workflows to the ICAP and AI media ecosystem, you'll also find that that makes it easier to try to plug in new workflows in captioning AI and translation AI. So you'll have a plug and play when you have the Alta solution with AI tools, which you can mix and match with any other, you know, more traditional forms of captioning. And it gives an opportunity to find out where the quality of the ASR software is, is working well for your content. And at that point, really be able to, you know, increase automation and dial in some savings from using those automatic approaches. The Alta system fits into a video workflow um, pretty much the same way as a conventional caption encoder, which, you know, not even assuming that everyone in the audience is familiar with that, but essentially you have a video stream 
uh, going into the product. And what's coming out of the product is a video stream with captions added into it. And those closed captions that are added into the output stream are invisible if you're just decoding the video and the audio, um, but they're in the metadata of the program and they travel with it essentially through any other set of transformations in the chain. Um, and at the end viewers set, right there, they're closed captions. So they're able to be turned on with your remote and you're able to, you know, decide, you know, if there's multiple languages, you can decide a closed caption channel or teletext page that you want to view the captions on and it's the viewer's choice. So the data travels with the video, it travels bound to the video stream in real time. And what the caption encoder does is take that data from sources of transcriptions in real time and merge it into the video. And, and you know, so it's time synchronized um, just as it comes in. Um, the main way that that's done with um, products like an EGSDI encoder or Alta is uh, through the ICAP cloud. So the ICAP cloud um, is hosted by AI Media and is offered to other third-party caption companies as well. And captioners are able to use ICAP to connect to, you know, they use an authorization token provided by the broadcaster who, who owns the actual Alta or encoder, and they're able to use that to make a connection through the cloud to that encoder for the you know, specific purpose of hearing audio uh, through a little player and um, sending the transcription back. And that, that same kind of role can also be fulfilled by automatic caption or translation services to add additional captioning. So kind of either way, this has the benefit of the EEG encoder or Alta program um, really doesn't have to be modified or changed or have something additional purchased or installed to switch between different caption service sources. Um, as long as they use ICAP, it's all just going to plug and play. And, you know, there isn't a, a situation really where you need to, you know, handle different, different VPNs or network connectivities or styles of communication in order to, you know, change vendors or work with multiple vendors or use automatic captioning sometimes and human captioning other times. That's really, that's all kind of handled and abstracted through ICAP. So, so that's really why that's a power, such a powerful idea and why I think in America, especially over the last 10 years, it's really become you know, the de facto standard for how live captions are delivered into these kind of workflows. Um, so if you're using an SDI encoder that uses ICAP, um, the Alta systems are pretty much a complete drop-in replacement for that. And the caption service sources that you use, um, in a sense, barely need to know that there's been a change. They're going to receive the same audio and video feedback signals. They're going to enter captions in the same way using the same software and the same drivers. So it should be a very simple transition. The, the basic all to compressed video workflow is, is kind of shown on the left here. And I think that's a, you know, a good starting reference to move from the previous diagram because in an MPEG transport stream workflow, um, the workflow can be you know, very simple in terms of all of the components of your broadcast, if that's video, audio, and ancillary data, that all will go in a single IP stream. So we can have a unicast or a multicast, it can be wrapped in something like a, you know, effect stream with forward error correction or an SRT stream that adds extra encryption and error connection. But basically you have a single stream of IP packets and some of them are video, some of them are audio, some of them might be triggers and timestamps and other things, but you have a whole stream of packets and, you know, one stream goes in and uh, you communicate with ICAP to get your live captions and the, you know, the stream pops out the other end essentially, and it has 
all of the, it doesn't recompress the video or audio or change the formatting fundamentally, but you essentially have, you know, 99% of the same data and 1% uh, new data, which is, which is the new captions. Um, and the Alta product contains a full MPEG transport stream compliant multiplexer. So we can take uh, DVB or ATSC captions and put them directly in the video and audio program stream. Uh, you know, and then the output of this is directly a new master signal that has the whole program multiplexed into it. Now, it's also possible to use this um, with an external multiplexer. And you know what that would really look like is you could feed in on the input only audio and timing data, um, and you could put on the output just a caption elementary stream. And this wouldn't be as applicable with a typical USA um, ATSC workflow, since in that case, the captions go in user data in the video. But in you know European, Australian, and other markets that are DVD, um, there is a separate transport stream uh, that runs with uh, that runs with the teletext or subtitles, and so you know you can output that separately from Alta, and you can mux it back in with the matching timestamps using an external mux, and the the that has some bandwidth transport advantages. And you know the other main advantage of that could just be that you know essentially you're not incurring any additional latency or risk to the main program feed. You've essentially put the caption insertion in a side chain, which you know then has you know has some benefits, assuming that that third party multiplexer does exist, but can be used in either format. Um, the twenty one ten workflow in is very similar in concept introduces some you know new complexities in a way because 2110 uh always breaks down the entire program into a couple of different ip streams so in 2110 there's an independent ip packet stream uh for video and one for audio and one or more for ancillary data and they basically, they, they, the packets go through the network separately as part of separate streams with separate multicast addresses, typically multicast. And uh, they're timed together by having the same PTP timestamps and PTP being a time synchronization protocol that every device that implements 2110 video uh, needs needs to follow and essentially right you'll get the get the clock from something that's like a GPS lock master clock in the video plan. So Alta in the in the uh, 2110 domain will will take in the audio stream. Uh, it will take in an upstream ancillary stream if, if you're merging captions from different sources or you're looking to merge captions with other triggers or picture data that's in the ancillary. And it will put out only the 2110-40 ancillary stream that has your new captions, which are equivalent to SDI VANC captions. So that would be in a format like the 6101 VANC packet um, that's used in North America, or else a OP47 VANC packet or a SMPTE 2031. Um, so th those will come out in 211040, and write that 211040 stream is still tieable back to the original video and audio essence because all of these devices are locked to the same clock. So it comes out in a frame synchronous way, and it's easy to merge downstream. Um, with the original source of video and audio. So we support on both of these products um, a, a couple of different caption output formats. And uh, most, most of the choices here um, involve regionalization and what the, what the customers target is for, for their broadcast. Um, so probably the most common use case we'll see is embedded uh, 608 and 708 captions. That is the broadcast standard in um, ATSC countries, uh, you know, United States and Canada. Um, the, uh, it's, also, it's also commonly used if you look at, you know, kind of 
global um, streaming platforms that will ingest captions in an embedded stream. Uh, the most common one that's supported will be the embedded 608, 708 captioning. And the embedded captioning is, uh, is very well standardized. It's very easy to read. Um, it'll even survive conversions, you know, pretty easily to, you know, to formats like HLS or even RTMP. So it's pretty robust. It tends to be very interoperable and travel with the signal well. Uh, the main downside of it is that they do need to, you know, the packet stream does need to go into the video frames. Uh, it's somewhat limited in bandwidth and in what languages can be supported. Um, and you, you know, it's not really because it goes in the video stream, it's not always easily compatible with some types of, especially more like AV focused workflows. Like if you have variable frame rates during freeze frames and that, that can get a little bit weird when the captions are embedded in the video. Um, so some other popular choices for outputs, there is a, uh, you know, there's a DVB teletext output that would be like a, OP47 or SIMPD2031 VANC packet in the 2110 space where it's a you know, baseband SDI-like space, um, or it would be the DVB text streams in MPEG transport stream. And that's um, the most common live captioning format um, in UK, Australia, um, most areas in Europe. And you know, that's going to write work with a home receiver in DVB format uh, countries. There's also a DVB subtitles mode in the Alta TS product. And that is the alternative captioning standard in a DVB. And it allows you to put out subtitles where they're fully rendered at the point of insertion. So um, that gives you uh, some additional control as a content producer over, over the style and appearance of the subtitles. But the most important reason for using the DVB subtitles is that you know you can you can support pretty much any character set and language in DVB subtitles, whereas the uh, DVB teletext or the US 708 standard are fairly limited in their character set support. Um, but essentially you can render uh, anything in a product like Alta um, from, from, a, from a caption source and, uh, and that'll go straight to the viewer um, as, a, as a compressed picture essentially. So the, you don't have to worry about the viewer's uh, set top box or other receiver not being able to, um, to receive a certain character set. Um, you know, the, the bad news about that is that at the point that the characters have been rendered into um, a picture, it, it means that they're going to be difficult to extract or reconvert for, for future processes. So you have to, at that point, uh, you know, use like a character recognition software and the accuracy of that um, is not always perfect. So the format is, is probably best for kind of sort of last mile delivery and when content is going to be repurposed in a lot of ways, it, ha it has some issues. But a lot of times the determination of one of these is just going to be really which, um, what broadcast region a customer is targeting, you know, so for, for better or for worse, an individual customer generally doesn't need to wade through the different choices here. It's going to be pretty clear what your delivery spec and what your consumers are going to need to see. All of those different styles can be supported by a range of caption sources in Alta. And, you know, I went through this a little bit before, but, you know, to think through the different kinds of things that, that can be done and are regularly done with Alta, um, we have a lot of ASR captioning. Um, you know, a lot of times the IP transition is also an opportunity for broadcasters to think about how to move to more software based and automated workflows in general. Um, and, you know, if you want to be able to turn on captioning uh, without, you know, really, without really a pre-arrangement and kind of just turn something on with a software API at the drop of a hat, you're probably going to need to be working with a completely software 
based workflow. So something that just turns on automatic captions when you ask for that. So Alta has pretty robust support for automation on that. We have calendars for Lexi for advanced scheduling. Um, so there's really a lot of advantages then to doing the AI captioning. And that's something that a move to the Alta systems will, will really help with is figuring out where it's sensible to be, you know, kind of moving to ASR and AI captioning in your workflows. And for a lot of um, content that's, you know, relatively relatively simple in the uh, in the presentation, you know, something that is like a newscast, uh, you're going to see very, very good performance with today's generation of Lexi and smart Lexi systems. Um, for a lot of for other content, you know, we, we do see some Lexi usage in a sports context, but sports content is often more difficult. Um, if you have other content that's, you know, markedly difficult, for example, um, you have debate shows where there's a lot of different speakers coming up, um, or if you're just looking for a higher degree of kind of human preparation, then that can be a great opportunity to work through with professional stenographers or voice captioners. And that's a service that you can contract with AI media or with a variety of other ICAP partners. And we have uh, most of the major live caption service players, um, certainly around the English speaking world and in uh, a lot of the world in general are able to make connections through ICAP and they really would just need to know that your content is, you know, that you're connecting up to ICAP and they would need to know, you know, your encoder IDs and the access tokens that they were going to need to use. Um, in order to get there, you share it with uh, with their agency and they, they can manage the rest. Um, so that, that's going to be easy with ICAP. Um, you also can support more legacy ways of doing captioning, right? Like without ICAP, a lot of caption devices will just use a plain TCP IP port for captioning, just, just enter some command data um, essentially through this Telnet link. Hopefully if that Telnet link is being used remotely, you know, it's being secured through a through a VPN or other mechanisms because because otherwise you're you're not dealing with really encryption or sophisticated authentication on that. But it, it can be secured adequately with external IT systems. And um, Alta does support that as well. Um, you can turn it on and off or choose which port it's going to listen on for each channel. But that allows systems that are um, completely like, let's say non ASR systems, typically, although sometimes it's a third party ASR, but also things like teleprompters and newsroom computer systems to connect in and send send captions or triggers to Alta. Or if you, for example, had a human caption transcriptionist who was coming into your event or facility and doing the work locally, and then there was maybe no reason to be, you know, moving out to a cloud connectivity service, um, all of the standard caption software that human transcribers would use will work through this interface. Um, Finally, if you are using a live to air insertion workflow, like this is especially true in domains with the DVB subtitles, uh, a lot of times there's a workflow where uh, there's an archive of pre-prepared caption files for all of the different programming that's going to air. And, uh, and those are, you know, those AI media or many other vendors can provide you with these these subtitle files they'll be you know generally more um you know more perfectly prepared than would be possible for a live program you know a craft editor essentially will you know get everything right um in terms of language will um position the subtitles appropriately on the screen um mark any type of nonverbal cues so um you know, recorded is typically held to a somewhat higher quality standard by regulators and, you know, by alert audiences than, than the live subtitles. Um, but so you'll have these recorded subtitle files and they'll be spooled out with, with communication with the automation system and the, the, the time code for the video that's in band. And uh, that's a, 
that, that that's a subject where we've been starting to put a lot of new features into Alta, um, and especially we're going to be showing some of that at the IBC show, um, as that's a strong need that we've found, um, you know, outside North America, um, say in the European and Asian markets. So I, I hope that was helpful in terms of understanding the basics of the Alta program. We're going to go through now and kind of talk about some of the new features released um, this year and especially since the NAB show in April, where, where we were last presenting the product. And we've actually been adding things, I think, at a, at a pretty strong clip. Um, one of the key ads recently has been support for the SRT protocol. And uh, if you're not familiar with the SRT protocol, there's a, you know, a very robust group of vendors supporting this currently in the, in the streaming and WAN transport space for video. And the protocol basically builds on a traditional MPEG transport stream, but it adds some extra features um, for encryption and for error correction. Um, that that are kind of missing from just using a basic transport stream and that can make using a basic transport stream uh, over a long distance network um, kind of frightening because there isn't really enough error correction in the basic protocol to tolerate um, losing very much data. So um, the, the SRT protocol is really effective at, at getting over that problem. Um, so we've, we've added SRT support. Um, it pretty much all of the features in Alta in the transport stream product work the same essentially, except we communicate with other SRT senders and it gives you the ability to have that encryption and error connection. And, you know, especially we'll commonly see customers who run Alta in AWS and want to communicate between, um, you know, regions, availability zones, or a on-site video collection uh, to production in the cloud, that's very commonly an SRT application. We've also added CC match into the transport stream altas and um, CC match is a feature that we've supported in SDI encoders for a number of years. Um, in some ways, it's even more helpful in certain types of OTT and event spaces because uh, I think there's a little bit more there's a little bit more uh, delay sometimes in these streams to work with. Um, CC Match allows you to actually delay the video and audio programs in a local buffer to the captioning system so that the captions that are live can be caught up to the video and audio. So the end presentation is that live subtitles, which would typically be, you know, in the range of at, at best four or five seconds late compared to the audio, because whether you use a human or an automatic process for live subtitles, um, there is a need to recognize the words, to hear them, to reform them. So, so there's some inherent delay there. Um, so uh, CC Match allows you to correct for that so that what the viewer experience will be is more like what's typical with um, pre-recorded subtitles where the title is directly in place with the speaker saying the words. And, uh, you know, that's, that's done, of course, by sacrificing some of the, the in to out latency of the video. So that has to be okay in the specific workflow. But if you're able to do that without compromising other aspects of the audience experience, it really gives you an ability then to create much higher quality experience for the live subtitles than you would have been able to do otherwise, you know, just because of the inherent limitations of needing to hear and then, and then caption. We've also put in some new features for Lexi automation with Alta. And this is also something that brings up, uh, brings up Alta to a greater level of feature parity with our SDI products. With the SDI products, we found that a lot of customers, especially in the local broadcast domain, would operate um, using Lexi automatic captioning for newscasts and would actually be running this in almost entirely a, a hands-off way 
plugged into the automation system. And so the station newsroom automation would send uh, GPI messages to the local SDI caption encoder when it's time to start or stop Lexi or on certain other conditions. And this would allow the captioning to come in really um, almost without additional scheduling or intervention. And um, of course, Alta is a fully virtualized product and a contact closure system was something that, you know, for GPIs was something that wasn't on this hardware. So uh, we've integrated with a few new virtual GPI protocols and those allow you either to use simple interfaces, um, essentially simple APIs to ask Lexi to start locally to your hardware, which are simplified compared to the existing APIs that would let you start Lexi from its core cloud service um, at eegcloud.tv. Um, and you also can now interface with uh, physical boxes like the one that's shown, um, which is basically a converter that goes from a physical GPI on off electrical switch uh, to software driven API automation. So uh, these kinds of products are, are pretty common out there. And if you have a plant that is sort of hybrid in terms of having both IP and physical components not being totally virtualized, these kind of solutions can help bridge the gap. And you can do a lot of neat things with this, like change the Lexi settings, um, turn Lexi on and off, and um, you know, even insert extra data in Lexi, like a speaker change marker, um, if you have it connected to the audio board. Another system we've seen that be used a lot for is uh, SCSI triggering. So these, these SCSI 35 and SCSI 104 triggers are increasingly being used as a key component in the ancillary data to uh, trigger ad insertion systems and mark for streaming platforms or for local broadcast affiliates where, uh, where you can insert additional advertising or where you can clip programs. Uh, we insert the SCSI 104 triggers uh, in Alta trans in Alta 2110, uh, which are which are baseband versions of the triggers, and the full SCSI 35 triggers, which are bound to the MPEG transport stream timing uh, in the Alta TS product. Uh, so that'll work with automation systems that send the message over TCP IP or or GPI. Uh, there's also a presets menu in the Alta product that lets you create your own trigger maps and then you know be able to send those kind of from a from a more from a simpler API that doesn't require you know authoring of, of all of the different study fields. Essentially the Alta software will auto detect the correct settings for most of them and simplify it back to being a, a contact closure kind of on off application in the API. One other application to note, and we've, you know, this has been in, in Alta for a long time, um, but we've kind of been continuing to work on it and, and seeing, seeing a lot of these is, of course, in the IP video space, uh, there's a lot of very well integrated systems, you know, from, from brands like Everts, Imagine, Grass Valley that have some captioning features in addition to a lot of other, you know, video and audio processing, monitoring, routing, um, clipping and packaging. Uh, so a lot of times we see broadcasters using Alta in combination with these systems, uh, where largely the, the role that Alta serves is as an interface to the world of ICAP and to all of the you know, human captioners, third-party human captioners and uh, Lexi systems that connect primarily through ICAP because you know, one of the key challenges in, is in connecting remote captioners is making sure you're able to provide them with a stable and secure source of program audio and video. And ICAP, as we saw, is a really elegant and simple solution to that and kind of adds something there that a lot of the um, simplified uh, channel in a box products don't really provide a great solution for. So um, what you can do is you can use Alta in these environments and all you need to do is feed it the, the audio and you know preferably also the video, but really the audio is, 
the only thing that's uh, core mandatory for, for most captioning. Um, so you can feed it in the SMPTE 211030 audio standard or as part of a transport stream and you feed audio into the Alta program and Alta will, in addition to or instead of putting out an output video stream with captions into it, will feed the captions through API uh, directly to the third party platform, which then may be responsible for repurposing them into all of the different outputs, because commonly the platforms are, they're capable of outputting in baseband, they're capable of outputting in compressed, they're capable of delivering recordings or streams, and in the internal data path, once they have the captions from Alta, they'll be able to use that in all of the different workflows that are supported through the channel platform. So definitely also a good use case for Alta. Um, generally really not a problem interoperating um, with any of these common pieces of kit. Now I alluded to this a bit before, but you know, to, to talk about like a, a really key benefit here of, of what we're trying to do in IP uh, is the deployment strategies that we can offer. So the Alta product, we, we have kept that sort of completely virtualizable. So what it means is that um, if you're looking for something that's more like a traditional SDI caption subtitle inserter, um, you know, we, we can ship that in pretty much the same package and you plug in the IP cables and you can configure it and you're ready to go. So we certainly support a pretty traditional broadcast vertical rack kind of structure. And sometimes doing that also makes a lot of sense for anything that's, uh, you know, an event that has a, has a travel kit and you kind of want to just like plug in the rack and, uh, and have it all work together. Um, most commonly, though, we have customers running Alta in a pure software container environment. So either an on-prem virtualized environment or a cloud virtualized environment. And, um, you know, we'll provide the templates that you need to set up an installation like that if you're demoing or purchasing the product. And it's really fairly simple uh, to get this stuff running. Um, and basically for each video stream that's a channel of Alta, you may need many less of these uh, containers than you want to run channels. So it would be totally reasonable to run five or 10 or even 20 different Alta stream channels uh, through a single one container. And the container just handles control and you know, networking and, you know, for, for the whole list of channels. So you can, you have an API there and you can turn the channels on and off. You can change the configurations. Uh, if it's 2110, you can also use the standardized NMOS API for that kind of application. So the, the container handles that kind of basic infrastructure plumbing and, uh, and the channels run independently after that. And you can really run as many channels as you're allocating CPU and memory resources um, behind the container. So that's, uh, that's been our deep dive into the Alta system. Um, I hope that, I hope that that kind of demystifies uh, some of some of what we're doing with with Alta and with IP video captioning. Uh, I know that for a lot of you know, potential customers and users, um, you know, IP video itself is something that's, you know, fairly new in the production space. And you see a lot of, you know, a lot of different material out there about it, a lot of, you know, a lot of it's very abstract. And the question can become, okay, in an application like subtitling, how do we just solve the problem? You know, what's, uh, how do we plug this product in? And I hope the webinar gave you a little bit better of a feeling of how Alta works with your captioning sources, with your video ins and outs, and what the process would be like of actually working with the product, um, as well as looking at what it is and what it isn't, you know, how it compares to products like an SDI inserter, um, you know, or, or even our Falcon software or other forms of delivery of captioning, you know, something like AI Live or stream text that basically provide a, a plain text feed outside of a broadcast context, 
you know, these are all part of the mix for a lot of our customers. But when you have the professional broadcast, OTT, um, high-end live event space, working with one of these standards like a transport streamer 2110, uh, then, then Alt is the product for you. And uh, we'll be happy to talk any more about that in, in the Q&A um, or, or any of the other AI media products. And, um, you know, please, please get in touch with, with myself or, or with, uh, with your sales rep and any other questions or requests for a more hands-on demo, uh, we're happy to honor that. So uh, thanks for coming. And uh, again, anything welcome in the Q&A. I'm going to probably well, I think I'm welcoming Avery uh, back and uh, Josh Huddle, our, uh, our product manager for uh, Alta and uh, SDI video insertion in to uh, assist with, with this session as well. Perfect. Thanks so much, Bill. We've got a lot of great questions here, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Jay asks, how much internet bandwidth does the ICAP transmission use? Yeah, so that would be... Um, you know, it, it depends somewhat on whether you're streaming uh, the video program to the captioner or just audio. It's generally best to stream both. Um, if you're streaming the video program to the captioner per channel, it runs about 500 kbits per second. So it's a pretty compressed stream, which is, you know, kind of helps with the remote captioners because they don't really... Um, you know, they don't really need a big honking stream that's going to maybe increase the risk of having a disconnect um, while they're captioning. Um, so the ICAP video is designed to be, you know, it's somewhat reduced frame rate. It's fairly small uh, postage stamp, but what it's really good for is to help the captioner contextualize the program um, to kind of make sure the positioning looks approximately right since, you know, tradition, traditional workflows, the captioner is responsible for the positioning and broadcast captioning. Um, when you're using Lexi ASR, it also works with our Lexi vision system, which uh, provides automatic positioning away from graphics and supers on the screen. Um, so it, it tries as hard as it can not to overlap with any other textual information, which is, you know, always good for the viewer and is a regulatory requirement uh, that's called out in a number of countries. Um, so yeah, transmitting the video is better. Um, if the video isn't being transmitted um, and you're just using static caption positioning, then that goes down to about 50 to 100 kbits per second. So kind of really disappears down into the noise at that point when it's only audio. Perfect, thank you. And Timothy asks, can a Dante AV network feed this system? Uh, it does not. It does not speak the Dante protocols natively, which you know, uh, for the audience, I'll, I'll try to explain this as someone who hasn't <laughs> really used it personally. But I mean, you know, Dante is an IP audio system. Um, I, you know, I believe that the it wouldn't be too difficult to convert the audio from that into a like an AES 67 style output, which would which would be similar to SMPTE 211030 and could then be used. But I think you would need a different um, output or a converter because the Alta product doesn't directly speak the control language of the Dante system. So I believe that those systems have a kind of a management and control layer that that Alta does not currently have a driver for. Perfect. And we might have just touched on this slightly, um, but there's a question here asking, does the Alta solution allow the closed captioning to be positioned anywhere on the screen? And are you able to change the size of the font? Um, currently, we do not support this at this time. Uh, Bill, do you, do you want to add to that? Well, tr traditionally in, in broadcast captioning, the, um, the position is actually is controlled by the authoring of the captions rather than the encoder of the captions. So we actually, on the SDI encoders, there are some GPI functions that allow you to lock the captions or subtitles to a certain region of the screen. Um, 
And I don't think that is currently on the Alta products, but um, prob probably ought to be. <laughs> um, but the conventional workflow is that the actual, either an automatic captioning software, which a lot of them don't do this, but Lexi can with the Lexi Vision plugin, um, basically the Lexi or the human captioner is able to control the positioning of the captioning and they'll actually do that um, dynamically or based on input from their client to, you know, to avoid something like a scoreboard or a news ticker. So typically that's controlled as part of the stream of, of caption commands coming through because the captioner, it's sort of a simplification to think that the captioner just provides words because they also really control um, between you know the operator and the software. It controls the pace of the text. It controls the position of the text. It controls how the text is broken up into different lines or rows. So the whole readability experience is, is generally controlled by the authoring software. Um, and uh, you know, as for as for size, it it depends what um, what standards you're using. Because if you're using DVB subtitle, where the captions are are rendered essentially in in Alta, um, then you then you need to control the size and the appearance. Like every aspect of that comes from Alta. Um, if you're using a US format 708 captions or DVB teletext-based captions, then there's really kind of a, there's a single style for that. And uh, the viewer typically, you know, if anything, the viewer will be able to control the size and the style of the text um, on, on their TV. Like definitely in the US, there's a, you know, th there's a concept of a viewer override built into it. So really the style from the, uh, any style that comes from upstream and from the broadcast room, from the caption writer, typically gets overridden by the settings that are actually um, configured by the viewer's choice. And the FCC has also asked that that be moved online. Uh, I think it's it's honestly a, a work in progress in a lot of popular platforms, but um, you will see platforms where when you click the CC button, not only can you get the captions to come up, but you can also choose you know, font style size and uh, the platforms that are really compliant with that, um, you know, do give you a lot of cool options, which is especially useful in, you know, mobile and smart TVs and all the different kinds of screen sizes and devices that you could use to view the same stream today. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Here's a question regarding Lexi's auto captioning. How reliable is it captioning people with accents? Yeah, I, I mean, that, that's an interesting question. And it really, um, you know, uh, there's, there's no limit to how ununderstandable a, a speaker can be. So I think that that's, uh, you know, clearly at some point, the speaker is not understandable and the caption accuracy is going to suffer quite a lot. Um, I think the Lexi captioning is not dramatically more sensitive to this than, um, you know, a, a typical hearing person from a relatively standard, like, like, you know, if you think about what would be considered a fairly standard accent in, in a language, like in English, you could say, okay, there's a fairly standard, you know, English, American, Canadian, Australian accent that, that people are picturing. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of training data in the system for any of these, what you would perceive as standard accents. When you have less standard accents, like people who are, you know, foreign language speakers speaking a second language, it becomes more challenging. Um, typically, if as a if as a listener, you find the person clear on a word for word basis, then you should expect very good performance from the captioning. You know, if as a listener, you find that the speaker isn't clear on a word for word basis to you, and you're kind of struggling or, you know, only capturing, you know, maybe, maybe you understand the gist of what they're saying, but you're not capturing it word for word. That's probably a good sign that, that most captioning systems are also going to struggle. And, you know, even, 
even a, a human captioner could perhaps get better with a specific, you know, type of accented speaker. But but basically, you you will start to get to the point where if it's if it's hard to understand the speaker, then the captions are going to have trouble because the captions are really trying to be verbatim. And so, in any situation where you'd have trouble understanding the speaker in a verbatim way yourself, then the captions may also have trouble. Perfect. And switching back to Ulta here, what is the cost model for the Ulta product? Is it licensed per server? Um, yeah, so Ulta is licensed on a per channel basis. Um, depending on the number of channels purchased, uh, you'll get a, a certain number of oh, license key, which will provide you with access to all multiple channels, all the channels that you purchased on that, um, on one or multiple all the servers. Um, but yeah, it's a per channel basis as opposed to per server basis. Perfect. Thanks, Josh. Can Alta be used in an on-prem VM environment in a venue for live? And I apologize, I'm not familiar with this. I make video for local display, meaning is the latency low enough to be comparable to a dedicated broadcast encoder for captions displayed for guests in the venue? Um, so I wouldn't say the, the Ulta product is really would be meant, uh, for live venues per se, um, for that. Well, I think, you know, the key, the key is whether there's time-based compression in the video, I think, because for example, the 2110 product is going to have like no, no additional delay compared to SDI, you know, I mean, interframe delay, because there's no frame to frame compression. When you're using the transport stream product, it depends um, essentially on, on your video GOP or sequence size. Like if the video is compressed into two second blocks, that's actually, you're, you're going to see about an extra two seconds in to out delay while Alta adds the captioning. So, you know, I, I think that's the reason the question is a little bit complicated is because it depends on the video format, but it would be possible to, to use it with very low in-person delay like SDI, as long as like SDI, you were using a codec or video standard that, um, you know, that, that, that essentially iframes or um, no, no interframe compression, you know? So basically if the interframe compression is, is controlled tightly, then, then the in to out delay of alt will be controlled tightly. Perfect, thanks, Bill. And just being cautious of time here, we will end things off on this question. What languages does the system support? Yeah, so we support over 120 languages uh, as a source of captions using iCap Translate um, with human captioners, or we can also support 30 languages using Lexi automated captioning. Uh, for output, we can support all Latin characters um, through all modes, though there are some languages, as, as Bill mentioned, that use more like image-based characters uh, not supported in CA708 or teletext modes, uh, but they can be supported using DVB bitmap um, in our old uh, TS product. Um, so yeah, that's... Perfect. Yeah. Thanks, Josh. Um, so as we're coming up on time here, I'll wrap things up. I'd like to thank everyone for coming out today. And another big thank you to Bill and Josh for your expertise and our live captioning team behind the scenes. If you have any other questions about AI media in our offerings, please do not hesitate to reach out. Thanks again, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, Avery. Thank you.